So, good evening, everybody. I apologize for this inconvenience, but uh, yeah, there was a mistake in the organizations of rooms. Uh, yes, uh, last week in the last lecture, we discussed images of the body and gender constraints. We saw that visual representations of the body contribute to producing gender-specific differences that have no biological function. You remember I showed you Adam and Eve at the Gent Altar piece by Jan van Eyck. However, as these differences are represented on the body itself, they come across as being natural and not artificially produced. We also saw that in specific contexts, either femininity or masculinity finds itself being excluded from representation. A fact that forces us to ask ourselves systematically, in each case, who or what has not been made a subject of representation here? Who or what has been silenced? Who or what does not come into the picture? If I'm now giving you a separate talk on the topic of masculinity, it's partly because this is a relatively new focus of research one that has in fact only existed since the 1990s. I mean, for you, because you are so young, this is perhaps a long time ago, but it actually it's not a long time. Masculinity was always considered, and to an extent still is considered, to be the universal norm. A notion that referred to humanity in general, to the genderless, to all that was simply unmarked. This misapprehension has been an essential constituent of male identity and of the fiction of autonomy. Women alone was perceived and described as being explicitly of a gender. Her so-called difference with respect to men was seen precisely in this perspective of gender conditionality. A linguistic fact of both French and English is symptomatic in this respect. The French word homme, like English man, means both human individual and adult male human. Initially and understandably, feminists devoted their energy exclusively to reassessing, analyzing, and then also deconstructing femininity. It was only in the 1980s that within the context of debates on feminist theory, the step was made from women's studies to gender studies which defined the notion of gender as denoting a relational relationship between masculinity and femininity. Nevertheless, in numerous gender studies done in the 1990s, men and masculinity are often constituted merely the negative complement to in-depth research into women and femininity. It wasn't until the end of the 1980s that a broader field of research began to develop around the subject of masculinity. There had already been initiatives in this direction in the 1970s, especially in the USA, such as, for example, the book Men and Masculinity, edited by Joseph Pleck and Jack Sawyer, published in 1974. And for German-speaking Europe, I might mention the book by Klaus Tebeleit, entitled Männer Fantasien, published in West Germany in 1977 and 78. 
But this is not the place to give to go into detail about the various research approaches that eventually emerged within the field of men's studies and masculinity studies, all of which strongly influenced by the feminist movement and the formation of feminist theory. <coughs> evolved through gender studies, gay and lesbian studies, and queer theory. Um, similar to the initial phases of the feminist movement, the gay movement set out to reconstruct the history of homosexuality and to arrive at a stand up for a gay lesbian identity. <coughs> Queer, on the other hand, is a notion that stresses opposition to established identity constructs, opposition to the dichotomy of male versus female. But let us state clearly at the outset that masculinity, like femininity, must be seen as a category that is produced by discourse. A category that has been variously formulated in cultural terms over the course of history, and one that is necessarily interrelated with other categories, such as class, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. R.W. Connell, echoing a notion put forth by Antonio Gramsci, coined the term hegemonic masculinity, a concept that has played a crucial role in determining the orientation of research since the 1990s. On the one hand, hegemonic masculinity points to the inconstancy of ideals of masculinity throughout history. But above all, it refers to the existence of multiple masculinities. Merely being different from femininity does not constitute hegemonic masculinity. Equally important for the definition of this notion is the rejection, the rejection of other kinds of masculinity, and in particular, gay masculinity. Hegemonic masculinity corresponds to the masculinity ideal of a social elite, which means that of a minority, and this elite in turn is defined by the exclusion of men of lower classes or foreign ethnicities. <clears throat> In addition, the terminology indicates that it is not pure rule by force that is meant, but rather a complex power structure that determines relationships among various groups of men and women according to principles of subordination, complicity, and marginalization. Hegemony in the Gramscian sense signifies not only dominance, but rather a culturally conditioned acquiescence on the part of those who have been subordinated. Hegemonic masculinity has great persuasive power and even appeals to those who do not embody it. The notion of power pertains to the realm of work and production. It pertains to political space, to intimate relations, to sexuality, to fam family, and to a particular term, symbolic capital. On the critical points, in, one critical point in Cornell's concept is the assumption that in any given society, there is only one model of hegemonic masculinity. Of course, Cornell postulates his or her concept essentially for the period following the year 1450. But in the modern era as well, and especially in present times, 
numerous models of hegemonic masculinity can be observed. <coughs> and not only what Connell means, worldly manager. In the past few years, there has been a lot of talk about the so-called masculinity crisis. But what is all that rhetoric supposed to mean? If anything is in a state of crisis, it's a concept of why male elite hegemony in the Western world. Any talk about a crisis should presumably serve the purpose of overcoming the so-called crisis, which would mean, in the present case, returning to the previous state of affairs, namely that of unquestioned masculinity holding strong. Just a moment. <coughs> I apologize of my voice. I always have voice problems, but now I have a cold and it's much worse. <coughs> the phantasm of masculinity goes hand in hand with today's politics. A toxic mixture. So when you think of Austria, for instance, think of the Burschenschaft that we have here in Vienna. <coughs> in the <coughs> in the artistic field, also artists such as Jürgen Klauke, Urs Lütke, or in Vienna, Renate Bertelmann were already active in the 1970s, exposing the constructed nature of ideas of masculinity by means of parody in crossover works. It was only very late that art history began concerning itself with representations of masculinity. <coughs> Just a minute, I have to make a, a little break. One of the first books uh, published in the field was Margaret Walters, A New Male, A New Perspective of 1978. When in 1986, together with a few colleagues and students, I organized the third conference of women art historians in Vienna, we introduced a section to which we gave the title Man, Images and Myths. Uh, the publication is uh, by Isabel Barter and others, entitled Frauenbilder, Männer, Berlin, 1987. <coughs> a few copies are still available. Should you be should any one of you be interested, just tell me afterwards and I will bring it next time. But it's in German. Within the realm of German language art history, this was the first organized event that concerned itself with the representation of masculinity. This was followed some years later in 1995 
by the first symposium ever to be devoted exclusively to the topic of masculinity constructs and male myths in art and the visual media. A symposium that I directed in collaboration with Marianne Coase here at the University of Art. Uh, unfortunately, the conference proceedings were not published as a whole. They were just made avail available in individual, of an individual basis. <clears throat> Within the realm of German language art history, the first collected publication only dates back to 204. Namely, publications that bear the title of the conference, Männlichkeit und Blick, visuelle Inszenierungen in der Kunstzeit der frühen Neuzeit. In contrast to sociology, psychology, historical scholarship, and literary study in the field of art history, relatively little research in this direction has been done to date. Although it is clear that cultural artifacts and visual representations play a formative role in creating and sustaining ideals of masculinity. that you can see this in every field. Art history is always a very um, conservative discipline. <laughs> in what follows, I would like to show you images of hegemonic masculinity that exist in art, after which I'd like to present some alternative endeavors. One ideal of masculinity that has always been paradigmatic is that of the hero. Although this ideal has known variations during the course of history, there are some constant basic characteristics that can be identified beginning with mystical prehistory and continuing all the way up to the present, characteristics that can be gleaned from religious stories, legions, fairy tales, pictures of all kinds, films, etc. In Greek antiquity, the hero was a demigod, superhuman, endowed with enormous willpower and vigor. A fighter habitually victorious, fearless of death, one who usually fought for a common purpose. In Greco-Roman antiquity, the incarnation of the hero was Heracles or Hercules. After completing his 12 heroic labors, Heracles was brought to Mount Olymp and made immortal. Zeus, or Jupiter, had fallen in love with Alcamene and disguised as her husband, Amphitryon, made her pregnant. Before the birth of the child, Zeus had prof prophesied that the future ruler of Thebes and its neighbors was a about to be born. However, Zeus jealous wife, Hera, or Juno, managed to delay the birth and cause another child, Aristos, to be born first. And it was Aristos who came, became the ruler of Thebes. Hera persecuted Heracles with her hatred, and eventually he had to serve Aristos who imposed upon him the famous 12 labors. <clears throat> By virtue of being his father's son, Heracles was destined for great things. Due to repeated and ultimately unsuccessful female efforts to hinder him 
he found himself engaged in an anti-female struggle. Hera, sent two gigantic serpents to kill the nursling, but the eight months old baby strangles them. Later on in life, in a fit of anger brought upon him deliberately by Hera, Heracles murders his wife and three children. Late medieval sources, for instance, Sanctat in the 14th century, reinterpreted this murderous act as signifier, signifying Heracles' triumph over both the body and that is the female part of the human being and passions. What is characteristic of Heracles is his phenomenal physical strength, as it can be seen represented here in engravings, engravings by Henry Goldsius and Giorgio Gysi. <coughs> Heracles, like all heroes, is a hero who distinguishes himself by his physical strength. By his cunning, but not by his wisdom. As such, in the modern era, and especially in the Baroque period, he was often a figure with which rulers could identify. They always identified already in Roman times, but then also in the Baroque time. There was always Heracles was an ideal. The quintessence of this figure is that in the face of any perceived danger or viciousness on the part of an adversary, the use of every possible form of violence is legitimate. The reading of the scene portrayed by Goldsius can be ambiguous. It might be seen in a slightly ironic light with the two tiny men looking upon their unattainable idol. Here you see, uh, very often with sculptures also already before, you can see it in, 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 in different ways. You can also say it's, it, it shows the ambiguity and the problematic of having such an ideal. As it is often the case with me, the narratives can be different and at times contradictory. Thus, Heracles does not only succeed thanks to his violent acts. Prodicus of Chaos of the 5th century BC invented the legend according to which Heracles, having arrived at a fort in the road, had to decide between virtus, that's virtue, and voluptas, that means pleasure or delight. Naturally, our hero chooses virtue. Virtus is actually, he chooses virtus. Virtus is originally not in the Christian sense of righteousness, but rather in the sense of masculine vigor. However, the stories of Heracles dating from antiquity also tell of his excesses. They tell of his heavy boozing, his gluttony, and his insatiable sexual appetite. Few artists have portrayed this aspect of Heracles as unrestrainedly as Rubens. But you see here again the bipolariolo, um, the, the, uh, the ideal of masculinity. Heracles defeating the giant Anteus. Uh, here we see bodily strength combined with cunning. 
As the story goes, so long as Antaeus can keep his feet on the ground, this is the heirs and this is Gea, that is his mother, he remains invincible. So Heracles had to lift him up off the ground in order to be able to crush him in mid-air. Heracles becomes a hero of rulers. Thus, when in 1530, after having definitely put an end to the freedom of the Republican city-state in Florence, the Medici's re-established themselves as a ruling ducal family of Florence. They commissioned a colossal statue from Piaccio Bandinelli, which was then erected in front of the Signoria. This was now a pendant to Michelangelo's David. Heracles, five meters tall, standing over the fire-spitting giant Cacus, whom he has just slain. In a first sculpted version of the work, Bandinelli had portrayed the actual moment of the killing. Apparently, however, this was considered unfitting for such a distinguished location. And so Heracles now stands there, calmly with his defeated enemy at his feet, and the giant's head situated directly beneath the hero's genitals. What was to be brought to the viewer's mind was not the brutality of the act, but the power and potential violent force that radiated solely from Heracles' naked body. As we saw in the last lecture, Michelangelo's David served as a symbol of the free city of Florence. As such, it was to be seen as combining bodily beauty and mental alertness and competence. In stark contrast to this, Baccio Bandinelli's Heracles stood for the feudal absolutist ruler. It stood for pure power. The two figures together can be read as summarizing Florence's evolution from free city-state to subjugation. What is also manifest here is the linking of political allegory and masculine ideal. And so it has come to pass that this square in front of the Signoria has become a place completely taken over by masculinity. Let's just look a bit closer at the whole square. This square in front of the Palazzo Vecchio, that is in front of the Signoria, Florence Town Hall, was a symbol of the free city-state. You remember that there was a time when Donatello's statue of Judith stood in front of the Signoria. In the second half of the 16th century, the square was transformed into a symbol of princely might and power, a place that was totally male-coded. There were not only David and Heracles, but also Amanatis, foundation of Neptune, dated from 1560, in the equestrian statue of Cosimo I, Duke of Florence, made by Gian Bologna, dated 1581. Further statues were erected in the Loggia dei Lanzi, which had originally been intended for official receptions. The statues in the Loggia now included Benvenuto Cellini's Perseus with the head of Medusa, and two works by Gian Bologna, Heracles slaying the Centaur Nessus, and 
the abduction of the Sabine woman. This latter sculpture or sculptural group is considered by art historians to be a masterpiece of Mannerist art. It is an expansive sculpture designed to be viewed from all sides. It is a very paragon of a figura serpentinata that is basically a composition characterized by a spiraling movement. Yes, it's, all of it is true. But can such a stylistic description possibly suffice? Is it enough to identify the subject of the work in purely iconographic terms? The abduction of the Sabine woman is a scene that well suits the artistic intentions of mannerism. But if we look at the work from such a purely artistic perspective, we lose sight of what is actually before our eyes, namely the glorification of the kidnapping and raping of women. These two of sculptural works end with Heracles slaying the Xentaur Nessus, also by the sculptor Giambologna. Thus, the visual alteration of a public space can be seen as a symptom of a political change, namely the transformation from Republican city to dukedom and the end of a democratic evolution. This democratic evolution had actually been reached its apogee in the Trecento, but was already brought to a halt by the Medicis in the course of the Quattrocento. As you can see, there is no linear evolution. There are reversals. We always think, you know, that history goes like in a straight line, but it's absolutely not the case. And I think today, too, I feel that we find ourselves in a rollback phase, or at least at a moment in time when democracy is in danger of doing away with itself. In 1977, Ulrike Rosenbach created a video installation for Documenta 6 entitled Heracles, Hercules, King Kong, das Klischee Mann. She did this in collaboration with Valley Export and Friederike Petzold. The large format installation consisted of a photo wall on which there were two tableaus, each made up up of 12 individual photographs, as well as two video monitors and recorders. The photographs showed various works selected from art history in which a prototype of virile masculinity could be seen. These photographs included, on the one hand, reproductions of various portrayals of the Greek mythological hero Heracles, and his legendary deeds, and on the other hand, stills and excerpts from King Kong films. Accompanying these photos was a very large scale photograph of the monumental cast bronze statue of Heracles by Johann Jacob Antoni from 1717, located in the park of the Wilhelmshöhe Palace in Kassel, Germany. This is kind of a symbol of Castle Wilhelmshöhe. This statue is a replication of what is perhaps the most famous Heracles statue of antiquity, namely the so-called Farnese Hercules, we have seen it now, a work that was known many artistic adaptions. The Farnese Hercules is a marble sculpture dating from the third century AD a Roman copy of an original by Lucif, believed to have been made around 320 BC. The sculpture portrays a superhumanly strong youth hero in a contemplative pose. 
In Rosenbach's installation, yet another video monitor was incorporated into the wall, tucked into the crook of Heracles' arm. I hope you can see it, it's here. And another monitor screen on which the artist, one watched the artist's face in motion as it rhythmically and breathlessly repeated the word Frau, 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 woman, woman, woman. This was an early feminist artistic incursion into the concept of virile masculinity. Of course, the ancient Heracles figure was not, and today still is not, Christian. In the Christian religion, the warrior, the fighter, the slaughterer is actually not considered to be an ideal. I mean, from the perspective of early Christianity. Jesus was certainly not a hero in this sense. In medieval times, we can observe the following. There is no one and only ideal of masculinity. We often think of the Middle Ages as having been so Christian, with a Christian faith embracing all aspects of life, all social strata. However, this was not at all the case. This is a view of the 19th century on the Middle Ages, actually. And we still think in this. In the view of the church, and especially in the context of monastic life, humility was the most important virtue. A virtue that could hardly be considered heroic. But for the knighthood, what counted was not humility, but the victorious warrior. This total contradiction engendered a heroic figure that combined these contrary qualities, namely St. George. St. George counts among the most prominent Christian saints. The origins of this figure date back to the 4th century BC, and appear, and appear to be connected with the Eastern Mediterranean region. So it's pre-Christian, actually. George is seen as a miracle healer and a martyr who survives torture, repeatedly triumphs over death and rises from the dead. He becomes a helper in battle the patron saint of the Crusaders, and simply the ideal image of the Christian knight. With Jacobus de Varagene Legenda Aurea, dated 1273, George's multifaceted story acquires a canonical form. The legions tell of St. George's fight with a dragon to rescue the daughter of a king. This is a classical fairy tale scene. A city finds itself being terrorized by a dragon. In order to appease the creature, the townspeople first have to sacrifice animals to it, but then their sons, and then their virgins, daughters. When the king's daughter is chosen by lot to be sacrificed, St. George appears and fights a dragon, which he manages to injure severely. The rescued princess is then able to drag the dragon, now harmless, into the town using her belt as a leash. St. George announces to the Hessen populace that he was sent by God and that if they all allow themselves to be baptized, he will proceed to kill the dragon. Naturally, everyone agrees to be baptized. The king then has a church built and offers gifts to St. George, who then distributes them among the poor. A noble and valiant knight, George then rides off 
on his horse. In the tales told of St. George, he is offered the princess, but being a man who leads a chaste life, he turns down the offer. The myth of the fight against the dragon is among the oldest and most widely known myths that exist. The combat symbolizes the struggle against chaos, against evil. The triumph over evil also signals a new beginning. In the case at hand, the beginning of a Christian and therefore righteous community. It always signifies a mastering of nature as well. It means civilization being made possible. The positions of the sexes in this setup are symptomatic. The princess, a virgin, being rescued by a strong man, regardless of whether or not she becomes his in the end. Actually, I always find it amazing that the dragon figure exists in variant, completely different cultures, but it's a creature that actually doesn't exist. It's a figment of the imagination, a combination of the elements water, earth, fire, and air. A creation, a creature that sort of makes you think of dinosaurs. Then actually after the 13th century, dragons in European art uh, have been uh, painted with uh, rings somewhat like those of a bat, a feature that was certainly imported from China. In this illuminated manuscript from the 14th century, both main types of representation of the combat with the dragon can already be seen. One being the horizontal arrangement of the two protagonists, and the author showing the horse rearing up in a fight that takes place vertically. This was a favorite theme, not only in manuscript illumination, but also in mural painting. I show you here the example by Pisonello in Verona, dated 1436. Unfortunately, the left side of the fresco has been poorly preserved, but nevertheless, the painted scene shows impressively the contrast between the chaos of nature. Now, if the chaos, of course, is even stronger because of the bad preservation, but still. And on the other hand, the civilized courtly life. The scene was also very popular among sculptors. Take, for example, this marble sculpture by Donatello dated around 1416, now located in Florence Bargello Museum. Here we see the ideal figure of a youth combined with a combat scene, which is represented in relief on the pedestal of the statue. Or you see here, also in sculpture, uh, the very famous sculpture in the Racine in Prague, or Bernard Notke's wooden sculpture in Stockholm. Here again, we see an impressive contrast between the compact goof of horse and horseman, and on the other hand, the spiky, amphibian, unshapely dragon. The scene can also be found in jewelry, an example being this pendant from the end of the 16th century. St. George and the Dragon was also a theme that was treated in panel painting. Here is a notable example by Uccello, where we see a very impressive depiction of concentrated masculine strengths, which is almost cosmically enhanced by the cluster of storm clouds. And in total contrast to this, the gentle, slender, delicate princess. The sexual connotation inherent in the motive itself becomes manifest in Uccello's painting. The cosmic explosion taking place behind the scene and the phallic lance being thrust in the direction of the dark cave, which visually surrounds both the dragon and the princess. <clears throat> 
and which of course is the dragon's abode. And also the blood dripping out of the dragon's open mouth. So of course this is very sexually loaded. The notion of man subduing nature is underscored by the contrast between the volcanic cloudburst and the patches of turf arranged in abstract geometric fashion. Or oh, we have this very famous mural painting by Carpaccio. Um, in the Scuola di San Giorgio degli Schiavoni in Venice, no, it's not a mural painting, sorry. There are three canvases showing first the combat with the dragon, and he shows the whole story, and then you see here uh, that after slaying the dragon, then he comes back to town and you see that the, bat the baptism of the king and the princess. Carpaccio, the great storyteller of the nation art, he incorporated many oriental and specifically Turkish elements into his painting, which also combined medieval and renaissance elements. I'll show you again this. Evidence of the dragon's deadly ferocity is shown in graphic detail in the form of skulls, bitten off limbs, and partially decayed dead bodies strewn over the ground. From the Renaissance, we have the, uh, a young, from young Raphael a painting, or from Rubens in the Baroque period. This scene of the combat with a dragon cat tree occurring in art, although in variations that differ stylistically, I show you this uh, combined sculpture and painting by Assam in the church. Or you see the painting, uh, the classical painting from Joseph Anton Koch, who set the scene in an idealized landscape. So you see it's a continuous scene in very different stylistic forms. At the end of the 19th century, there is still no significant change. As can be seen in this painting by Hans von Marie, or the notion of dragon killer now finds itself being carried over from the religious to the political ring. Here, for example, is a Bismarck monument in Frankfurt dated 1908. So Bismarck is compared to St. George killing the dragon. Or in a general way, the knight in armor becomes an ideal of masculinity, which you see here in a painting by Hans Thoma, where a man in armor is shown guarding the garden of love. An even more extreme case to consider is that of a painting by Lovis Corinth, entitled Im Schutz der Waffen, so protected by weapons. This is dated 1915, in the middle of the First World War, and Corinth painted a medieval knight in armor and a naked woman. The gender construct becomes obvious here. The man in a suit of armor showing a stern face, the woman naked flesh, emotionally. We see in this example how incredibly reactionary such pictures are. We see how fictions of masculinity coincide with political attitudes. The First World War was no war of knights fighting against each other. It was no man-to-man -man war. On the contrary, it was the first war in which human beings were slaughtered in masses, a war in which there was no more use for man as an individual. The fact is that, beginning with the later part of the 19th century, what we witness is a masculinity image in a state of crisis. 
patriarchy in a state of crisis. Many reasons can be given for this. Industrialization considerably diminished the importance of physical strength, both in the field of production and in the conduct of war. The notion of man, the male individual, being autonomous, strong-willed and guided by reason, found itself being fundamentally challenged in several quarters. There was Freud, the self is not master of its own house, but it is guided by drives of the unconscious. There was Marx, man is not autonomous but dependent on the social conditions that surround him. There was Darwin, Ma was not created, man was not created by God, he gradually evolved as a member of the animal kingdom. And there were the natural sciences. And then there was the feminist movement. In art, the situation is reflected. On the one hand, by portrayals of man's prettiness. Take, for example, this painting by Egon Schiele. But on the other hand, there were attempts at portraying martial or warlike masculinity, which, considering social reality at the time, come across as almost ludicrous. You see, it's interesting that these two paintings are made more or less in the same years. And they are both dealing, dealing with masculinity, but from completely different sides. And it's hard to believe, but St. George is still going strong, in spite of having become totally obsolete. You will be amazed to see how and where he has managed to survive. It has not only been in the work of reactionary artists like Thomas Corinth and others. I think if you, I would ask you, nobody would guess uh, what comes now. It's highly remarkable that an artist such as Vasily Kandinsky, an artist of the avant-garde, and one of the very first abstract painters, made St. George one of his protagonists. And not only that, he also identified with his night figure. Vasily Kandinsky was born in Moscow in 1866. In 1896, he went to Munich to study painting. But when the First World War broke out, he had to return to Moscow. Later, in 1922, he accepted a teaching position at Bauhaus, first in Weimar and then in Dessau. But when the Nazis seized power, he had to leave. He lived the rest of his life in Paris, where he died in 1944. Along with Malevich and Piet Mondrian, he was among the most significant founders of abstract painting. In 1911-12, he wrote his book, Über das Geistige in der Kunst, concerning the spiritual in art, a work that can be considered a manifest of abstract art, abstract art having had for Kandinsky above all a spiritual meaning. It was an art that aimed at overcoming the material world. And it is precisely this overcoming of the material world, this overcoming of the sensuous and the natural that is symbolized by this figure, St. George. Kandinsky knew images of St. George from his native Russia, where the Byzantine iconic tradition always kept his image. Kandinsky took an in intense interest in the motive of the horseman and that of the knight on the horseback, 
I show you one of countless examples being this painting dated 1902. The knight is seen as a hero who triumphs over the material world or chaos. This conception is conveyed quite vividly in a reverse painting on glass dated 1911. Here we see St. George riding a blue spotted horse, which is kicking out his hind leg, and the very conspicuous lance slashing across the picture diagonally. We can still more or less clearly make out the horse and the horse mane. The dragon, however, has become an image of chaos. Shapelessness sinks terrestrial. For Kandinsky, the color blue represents the spiritual. He then also used this figure as a title character for the cover design of the Blue Rider Almanac. It's interesting to know that in this paradigmatic cover picture we see in the lower right hand corner the helpless princess looking up at the horseman. I hope you can see this. In the almanac, in which current artwork is shown in juxtaposition to traditional works, the horseman once again appears significantly side by side with an illustration for a story from Grimm's fairy tales, which was published in 1832. Franz Marc, who chose and commented on this parallel presentation, explains the connection is to be found in the experience of inwardness. In this version of the scene, the struggle against the struggle against nature, against things material which are also conceived of as being things feminine, becomes particularly clear. On the left, St. George, this time standing, is seen plunging his black lance into the open mouth of the dragon. On the right, hardly recognizable is the black line of the horse's back. Poorly definable female curved forms fill out the rest of the picture. George is represented here not so much as the princess rescuer as to the conqueror of the feminine. I show you another example. The white horse symbolizes the triumph of good. Kandinsky identified with the horseman figure. For him, the horseman was the artist. The horse stood for the passions, but also the abilities that had to be guided. In his autobiographical essay entitled Rückblicken, Retrospect, he compared himself to a horseman who has to harness and guide his talents. The artist overcomes the material world and by means of abstraction makes spiritual transcendence possible. This can be gleaned from Kandinsky's writings. Here you see a very abstract uh, version of this St. George. For Kandinsky, the horseman hero no longer distinguishes himself by the his physical strength, but rather by a spiritual essence. However, just how we are to understand the spiritual essence that has to be acquired through great effort on the part of the artist is never made clear in any concrete way. Is art and a, specific, a specifically abstract art? to be seen here as a substitute for religion. Kandinsky repeatedly speaks of the Holy Spirit as being what his art aims to achieve. 
and actually it's a known fact that Kandinsky also had connections to Theosophy and in particular to the Anthroposophy of Rudolf Steiner. Also, Kandinsky, unlike many of his fellow artists, such as Franz Marc, for example, did not voice approval of the First World War. He nevertheless partook in the enthusiasm for male heroism. St. George embodies precisely this ideal of masculinity, a fighter for his cause, a victor, and the act of killing by religious association finds itself being legitimized. Kandinsky thus had his part, albeit unintentionally, in the spiritual mobilization of the time and in efforts to build a myth around the war. The appeal to notions of chivalry significantly contributed to trivializing and ultimately denying the horrors of war. Although artists like Rind and Kandinsky can practically be seen as total opposites, this ideal of heroic masculinity is something they have in common. It was precisely because this ideal of heroic masculinity had become obsolete that reactionary circles latched onto it, and they did so most aggressively. In National Socialism, the heroic man became the sole ideal. However, it was not male individuals, but rather Arno Breaker's larger than life male nude sculptures that were supposed to symbolize the body politic with which the male individual was expected to identify. This longing for the strong man for the hero figure still persists. Take Westerns, for example. In this film genre, we see, for one thing, the myth of America's beginnings, with the white man as a symbol, a grotesque disregard for the ind indigenous American people. But Westerns always also convey masculinity myths. In the early Westerns, the male protagonist is still the guardian of the law and justice. Also capable of being violent, he is nevertheless a moral model. It's a good guy combating evil. And here I must say, I've often asked myself, just what distinguishes the good guy from the bad guy, since both ultimately do the same thing, namely kill. In many cases, it's a hero who is detached from society, independent, fatherless, motherless, solitary, a man who obeys only his own law, one whose relations in the world of men usually have priority over relations in matters of love. In the so-called spaghetti westerns, we call it Italo-western, morals get broken. Clint Eastwood as opposed to John Wayne. But what remains a constant is the physical man, hard as steel, a fighter fighting against a society that is in moral decline. Although debunked as means, the ideals of masculinity persist here. The mute, inscrutable hero, a body like a suit of armor, someone who shows no emotion, resolutely tough, a loner, and then there is the killing. We see Vesta Stallone as Rambo. We see the hero figure transfer to the context of the Vietnam War, a particularly cynical variation on the scene, even if Rambo only plays a war veteran who, bare-chested, finds himself fighting alone against the rest of the world. In various films, comics, and computer games, the aggressive ideal of masculinity lives on, but I'm sure that you know that here much more than I do. In this connection, I have to say that I was struck by the fact that the former Minister of Art, Culture, and the Media, 
and subsequently finance minister here in Austria, Gernot Blümel, when asked in an interview with the Vienna Daily, the standard on March 26, 2018, what his favorite film was, he answered that it was Mel Gibson's Braveheart, one of the most violent films made in recent years. But alongside this aggressive, heroic ideal of masculinity, there have also been alternative conceptions. We have too little time here to give these attention they deserve. In this context, I would like to refer you to three publications. First, a book by Marianne Coase that deals with lyrical male portraits in the early 16th century Venetian painting. Second, a volume edited by Mechtel Fend and Marianne Coase entitled Männlichkeit im Blick. And third, my remarks on Rembrandt in my book on 17th century Dutch paintings, the visible and the invisible. You'll find it in the literature list. It is striking that whenever an ideal form of non-heroic masculinity is exalted, the male body is depicted as being not only useful, but also in many cases wounded. This is certainly the case with the highly popular figure of Saint Sebastian. According to the legions of the saints, Sebastian was an older man and a captain of the Imperial Guards under Diocletian. When he openly professed that he was a Christian, the emperor ordered him to be killed by Archas. However, Sebastian did not die. A pious widow, Saint Irene, nursed him back to health. He then returned to the Imperial Guards whereupon Diocletian ordered him to be clapped to death in the circus and his corpse to be thrown into the Cloaca Maxima. In the late Middle Ages, he became the patron saint of victims of the plague. Beginning with the late 15th century, especially in Italian art, Saint Sebastian was portrayed as a beautiful naked youth in time, he became nothing less than the iconic, flawless male nude figure. This fact cannot be explained by the saint's legion, no more than by his status as pattern of victims of the plague. I show you other examples, and you always see that it's a, a very idealistic vision of his uh, body by uh, of, uh, Bellini or Titian or Lotto, where he, get, he looks almost like a woman, and by Benedetto da Maiano. Vasari, the first biographer of the 16th century Italian artist, writes about a version painted by Fra Bartolomeo, a work that has unfortunately been lost. The lost work by Fra Bartolomeo, painted in 1515 for the Priory of San Marco in Florence, is known to us thanks to a copy painted by Zacchia Alecchio, what you see here. Vasari reports not only that Fra Bartolomeo Saint Sebastian received endless praise on the part of the painter's contemporaries, but also that women in the confessional confined it that they had been allured to sin by the sight of the painting. As a result, it had to be removed from the church. Somewhat later, Lomazzo in his writings on art also leveled criticism at all two erotic figures of saints such as the painted by Fra Bartolomeo. In the 19th century, Sebastian found himself rising to the position of patron saint of homosexuals. A function that he has continued to serve in the 20th century. However, projecting this conception backwards to the 15th, 16th or 17th centuries, as also such as Sternweiler and Seslow have done, is inadmissible 
The notion of homosexuality that seems so self-evident to us is, in the form in which we know it, a 19th century invention. And we are actually still entangled in the dichotomous concept of the 19th century. In the early modern era, the notion of homosexuality did not exist. One spoke of sodomy, a term that was used to refer to all sexual practices that were not essential to procreation within the context of marriage. There existed homosexual practices that were strictly forbidden. In most cases, however, the persons concerned were men whose contacts were not exclusively homosexuals. In contrast to the state of affairs in the 19th century, homosexuality was not an identity-defining concept. Studies carried out by the great theoretician of queer theory, Yves Kosowski Sedgwick, indicate that it is rather a concept of homosociality that should serve as a point of departure here. This concept is one of a complex, many faceted, partly erotic, mutual attachment among men, an attachment, however, that does not necessarily result in sexual contact. With regard to the portrayals of San Sebastian, this means that in all probability many men also found these figures of a naked youth erotic, and that these portrayals found particular favor with men who had homoerotic inclinations. For instance, you see this other example of Jacopo di Barbari. This assumption is supported by the fact that the image of a young man with his breast pierced by an arrow, such as in this painting by Giorgione, is not necessarily to be seen as a portrayal of Sebastian, but rather can be interpreted in the sense of Petrarchian love poetry as being a depiction of a love-lorn youth. Marianne Coase had shown this. Uh, the image of an arrow piercing the heart used as a met metaphor for love <coughs> dates back to antiquity and specifically to the myth of Eros, or Cupido, who shoots his arrows according to his caprice. Passionate love simply comes upon one after, as it were, was nothing one could do about it. This conception was taken up again, especially by Petrarca in the Trecento. Petrarca, whose lyrical work influenced love poetry well into the Renaissance and beyond. There are portrayals such as this painting by Bernardino Lumini, the successor of Leonardo, a work that was for a long time sought to represent Sebastian, all the more so that the painting is quite in the iconographic tradition connected with Sebastian. In this case, however, as Marianne Coase has been able to point out, what we see is not in fact Sebastian, rather, as can be gathered from the inscription in the painting, the subject is unequivocally one of profane desire. The Latin verses, quam libens obtui amorem dulces jaculos partia memento, that means remember how gladly I endure the sweet arrows for the sake of your love. The love song is raised to the point of exaltation by this association with the martyrdom of San Sebastian. The fact that two such different motives, a saint's martyrdom on the one hand and a profane love song on the other, could be represented in such a similar fashion only points to the ambiguity of images that can be interpreted in a, rigid, in a religious and or in a rhetoric sense. So we close here. As you know, if you want, we see us in Friday. Uh, this Friday, actually, 
from 2.30 to 4. But uh, I understand, of course, if you have no time anymore and uh, orientate yourself for vacations and Christmas, or we see each other on the 9th of January, Monday, uh, on 12 o'clock from 12 to 1.30. Or we see us normally on Wednesday after Christmas. And I wish you a very happy Christmas. And yeah, all the best for the new year.